Thank you for watching this sermon from Kings Park International Church. Be sure to check out the other sermons in this series as well. Morning, Kings Park. Just want to appreciate our men and women at the back, just, just helping put some videos and just putting our cameras on our lyrics. Can you give a hand for our tech and prod? Just appreciate them always quietly just serving. Um, we really appreciate you. I just came from the Lynchburg fall retreat with the campus last night. It was worship night. Uh, Anthony had a hard time coming up, cutting the worship because the Holy Spirit was delivering young people. The Holy Spirit was casting out demons. It's like it was all over the place. I mean, we could have skipped the word, but, but they decided to still, pre, you know, still have a message. But I want for you to know God is doing something new in the young generation here in the United States. I, I want you to know that God is really pouring a spirit of revival. And we're going to be part of that. Hallelujah. Please open your Bible to Exodus chapter 15. We are starting to go back to a series we started last, uh, a couple months ago, Exodus 1. Please stand with me in reverence to God's word as I read with you verses 22 to 27. I'm reading from the ESV. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Mara, they could not drink the water of Mara because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, Please read that quotation with me. If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. Then they came to Elim where where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees and they encamped there by the water. Father, Thank you for your word. Open our hearts to know you. And Holy Spirit, open this word that we might live by it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat. When I was 12 and I was about to get to high school, uh, so we don't have middle school during my time in the Philippines, my mom said, would you consider applying for the science high school so that you can help me and Papa put you to school. They said they were gonna give me a stipend, they're gonna cover my board and lodging. The only catch is you're gonna live more than 250, about 250 kilometers away from our home. Because I live in the mountains of, of north of Manila and the school was in the heart of Manila in Quezon City. And I said, oh, okay, so I thought, I wasn't thinking I wasn't gonna see my elementary classmates and all that, but later on I realized I just wanted to help my parents and so, the months were coming, and I was preparing, studying, praying, going to church, just believing that I could have really this scholarship. And so the date of the examination came, and I was ready. I was fresh. We took, you know, there, it was going to be a whole morning, a whole you know, five-hour segment, and there were four sections. There was going to be science and math, so I took the exams. And then we, have a ten, we had a 10-minute break. And so I was so excited. I got to replenish my sugar and... I think I ate too much because by the time I started the English exam, you know, it happened. I fell asleep. (laughs) The paragraphs were so long. It was just, this is boring, you know. I'm not, I'm I'm, I'm not a reader. Um, At least at that time, I was not a reader at all. 
And then I heard, I woke up because the, the examiner was saying, five more minutes, you're gonna be passing your papers. I haven't gone through even more than half, maybe three fourths of that English section. I said, it's a good thing it's multiple choice. So I started shading those letters, whichever looked right, you know, B, A, C, D, whatever. And then I passed my papers, finished the other section, and prayed that God would just, you know, just do something. <laughs> Beloved, I passed the exam. I don't know if they made a mistake in checking, but I passed the exam. There is an end to every test. And at the end of that test, will there be a testimony? We all have gone through some kind of test or exam, board exam, maybe driving exam, you know, getting your license, boot camp for the military. You know, in life, we also go through tests and trials. Some of them short, some of them pretty long and tough. Going through life can also be painful sometimes. But have we ever considered why we had to go through them anyway? When we go through these tests, have we ever thought about what's at the end? Or maybe it's hard to see it while we're going through because it's been, it's been several months or maybe even several years. What benefits do we get from these tests? More importantly, have we become more dependent on God going through these tests? We pick up from where the people of Israel just came out of Egypt, the Exodus, a hallmark event in the Bible, referred to so many times in both Old and New Testament. They went through the Red Sea on dry ground. They stopped the most powerful, well, God stopped the most powerful army on the planet Earth during their time. With fire and a cloud coming between them and his people, God rescued his people, and not only did he rescue them, he decimated Pharaoh and the Egyptian army. All these by the mighty hand of God. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 31, it says, And when the Israelites saw the great power of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in his servant Moses. In fact, it was such a victorious moment, the start of Exodus chapter 15, Moses would begin to just praise the Lord and have a song. You know, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. You scroll down. They're declaring, who is like the Lord? Yeah, who is like the Lord? Nobody. And there, you see this, this celebration. You have Miriam bringing out her tambourine. Some ladies dancing with her. They were celebrating. God is good. He destroyed our enemies. We're free. And verse 22 comes. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days, and they were no longer sure <laughs> because they found no water. Imagine 600,000 men, plus women and children, plus livestock, water problem, very serious, huge problem. My Jordanian tour guide, you know, twice I was a chaplain tour at Jordan, Israel, and, and he said, and it's interesting, there's other problems in the wilderness besides the lack of water or the absence of water. He says, in the desert, you will have extreme temperatures, very cold nights and very hot days. In the desert, you will have sand in your face, in your nose, in your eyes. Maybe get down in your throat sometimes if you're not careful. In the desert, you will have wild animals, snakes, scorpions, beasts that are hungry. In the desert, you tend to lose direction because everything looks the same. It's like you turn there. I've been here before. It's like, how do you get around the desert? You need somebody who knows the desert. The Bedouins travel from water to water. The verse we read showed two places, Mara and Ilim. Both had water. Both were potential spots for, you know, just rest and camping. But mind you, Mara and Ilim were not their destination. These were not part of the promised land where God had promised their ancestors, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt into the promised land. These were temporary stops, and God was leading them there through Moses. But God had a plan. 
God intended for them to be there. Moses recounts this in Numbers 33, verse 8 to 9. He recounts how they went to this desert of Etham, and they camped at Mara, and they left Mara and went to Elim, where there were 20, 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there. That's what, that's what it says. It's just, they just passed through it. But the account that we read had something so important to reveal because Elim and Mara had one major difference. Mara had bitter waters. Verse 23, Exodus 15. When they came to Mara, they could not drink the water because it was bitter. In Mara, they could not drink. In Mara, the place of bitter waters, they grumbled. This is huge. Sometimes you think complaining and grumbling is just, oh, you know, it's all right. There was a murmuring in Mara. There was a whining in the wilderness. They were complaining with a temper. Well, you might want to ask, where did the victorious singing go? Where's the, the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name? Where, where did it go? You were just singing, who is like, well, let's, let's have a song right now, right here. Where did it go? How did they turn from being victors to victims? How did they turn from seeing a warrior to becoming warriors? They did not trust Moses that much. And it showed that they, their trust in God was very shallow. You see, there are levels of trust. You know, I might trust my mechanic for my car, but not my mechanic for my medical exam. It's just life, you know. But how much do we trust God? Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Well, it was easy to assess the situation. They've been traveling without water three days. They got all this multitude and these animals, and they, were, and they were thirsty. Okay, I understand that. But does God understand that? Or do we think God understands that? God understands that? What happened? They forgot. The fear of the Lord was gone. Trust was nil. They were again in unbelief. They were thinking like they were still slaves in Egypt. They were thinking suddenly that, you know, looks like our leader didn't plan this. Why does it not say that when they were at Elim, they celebrated, sang their songs? Why did it not say that when they're in the oasis, they were grateful? They praised God and thanked him for the 12 springs and 70 palm trees. You know, if you go to Egypt, northern border of Israel, there is such a place. I'm not sure if it's that's the place. Maybe they made out of place. I don't know. But there are palm trees, and there were evidence for springs. Interesting. But where did their enthusiasm go? Pastor Philip D. said last week in our core training, he said, you know, gratitude is the starting point of enthusiasm. They were no longer thankful. And in that place, at Mara, they could not see Elim. Of course, when we're in a place of bitterness, in a place of testing and trial, it's kind of hard to see what's next. It's kind of hard to see that there was something better, you know, there was something good waiting for us a, a few, you know, mountains or days away. But it is when we cannot see what is next that our trusting the Lord is put to the test. Is it possible for this bitter water to become sweet? Maybe if I was among them, I'd probably ask the same. You know, what do we drink? It's difficult to see where the Lord is leading us when we cannot see what's next. But is it possible for the bitter today to be gone tomorrow? <laughs> Question is how? Yes, it's possible. We just read it. Verse 25. And he cried to the Lord. Moses cried to the Lord, showed him a log. He threw the log into the water, and the water became sweet. Let us not remember Mara for its bitterness. Let us remember Mara for what God has done in and through them. You see, there were great things too that happened in Mara. Yes, in Mara they could not drink. Yes, in Mara they grumbled. But it was also in Mara that they saw a miracle they have not yet seen. It was in Mara where the bitter waters became sweet. How does that happen? I don't know. God showed Moses and he did something. It doesn't say that they thanked God after he saw, they saw the miracle too. 
Were there miracles in Elim? There was none. Sometimes we think that living in an oasis is all the miracle there is. Do not be consumed for an Elim when the Lord is showing us something at Mara. Because in Mara, they were tested. The Bible says in verse 25, it was there, it was at Mara that he made a statute for them and there he tested them. There is a reason why God allowed them through to go through those spots. There is a reason why we go through tests in life. If you were a child of God, you gave your life to Christ, and you said, God, shepherd my life, shepherd my soul, I want to tell you there is a reason every day that we pray and commit ourselves to God, there is a reason why we go through these tests. God never trips. God does not allow, you know, casual things to happen in our life. There is a reason. And when we go through these tests, you know, we have to find out, Lord, what are you doing? Because the greater tragedy is going through these bitter times and not, not learning or not knowing what the Lord is revealing to us. God had purpose to reveal himself as one who tests people. And this is what this series is about. In the next few weeks, we're going to see the Lord test the people of Israel. It's called the, some uh, scholars call it the wilderness university or the school of the wilderness. Psalm 11.5, the Lord tests the righteous. Proverbs 17.3, the crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests the, the hearts. Jeremiah 11.20 and also in 20 verse 12, O Lord of hosts, or Adonai Sabaoth, the God, commander of the armies of the Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous who sees the heart and the mind. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Beloved, this is what I want us to remember from this message. The Lord tests us to show what is in our hearts, to teach us his statutes, and to reveal himself to us. Allow me to break that down in three parts. First, the Lord tests us to show what is in our hearts. There were two responses to the bitter waters. One was complaining, the other one cried out. You know, they, they complained to Moses. They grumbled to Moses. Moses, what are we to drink? If I was Moses, well, what can you drink? <laughs> or... Do I look like a water filter or something, you know? Do I look like a reservoir to you? Don't you see water's coming down on my face? Am I drinking and you are not? Are we not in the same boat? Can't you see? I can see that we don't have anything to drink at this moment. Sometimes we think and act like God through our leaders or through our own lives is irresponsible. If you are a child of God, you're a follower of Christ, start complaining. Sometimes we cross the border of accusing God. Lord, you don't really know what you're doing. Lord, you are so nearsighted, you didn't plan this well. It's not going well. That's what we're saying. When we grumble, when we complain, sometimes we think God doesn't care. What is the image of God in your mind? Because to one who sees God as reliable, that man will cry out. It doesn't say he prayed. It doesn't say he petitioned. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are so thirsty. Can you please give us some water? No, Moses cried out, God, we're gonna die out here if you don't give us water. He just cried out because he knew that only God can save them. He cried out to the one person, the one being who brought them there in the first place. We cry out to God because there are things that only God can do. But I hope we don't exhaust what man can do before we cry out to God. I hope that he is the first and the last. 
We're so equipped to just, oh, I'm going to do this. You know, Filipinos, we call ourselves very uh, resourceful. <laughs> we can use anything for anything. <laughs> Not always works, but, you know. We love MacGyver, that show, but, you know, it is. It's like, everybody's called MacGyver. Okay, MacGyver. We can choose to act like we really know that God is able, that he is doing, that he is able to do a miracle for water, for food, for protection. You, know, you parents, you have kids, you travel to a place, 40 minutes, maybe an hour, you know, it'll be fine, but at some point, somebody's going to ask you, especially the little ones, are we there yet? Are we there yet? They ask you, they ask you three times in an hour, okay, okay. You make that trip two hours, and then an older child will say, are we there yet? It's kind of a different feeling. Uh, can we stop? I'm hungry. This is boring. Can we, can we see something else? Can I play my video game? No playing. We're moving. And you multiply that in a home. And God was dropping in my heart how parents feel in leading their homes, especially single moms and single parent homes, where they do their best to put food on the table and get things going for school. How would they feel? Sometimes we think that when we grumble, God doesn't feel things, that he's impervious to any damage of our complaining. Well, the Bible says God grieves. That God is a person. The Bible teaches that God is a real being who has feelings. Sure, he doesn't get damaged like we do because he is God. But it doesn't mean he doesn't feel the pain. When was the last time we complained? Maybe we're too shy to complain to God. But when we do complain, is God not here? God is a person who wants to reveal himself to us, wants to have relationship to, with us. But in the times that we complain about life in bitter situations, we cross the line of accusing God as reckless or stupid or nearsighted or apathetic. Well, God is not. The Israelites forgot the power and the glory of God just like that. They didn't attend our first series. We're having a second series. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3 says... And, you know, when Moses was recounting their journey, he says, remember the Lord the whole way that your God has, been, has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. What has God done in this test at Mara? He showed his people what was in their hearts. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow Beloved, what are the words coming out of your lips when people talk about elections, when people talk about the economy? What are the words coming out of your lips when you, when you think about work and, and placement and employment and, and school stuff? What are the words that are coming out of your lips when you do not get served really well? Are we part of the mob that complains and grumbles? Two women in the book of Ruth, an Israeli mother and her Moabitess daughter-in-law, went to Bethlehem. And when they came there, because Naomi, the mother, had lost, had two sons, married two Moabitess women, and both sons died. Even Naomi's husband died. And one left them, and, the, and Ruth just clung to her. They came to Bethlehem because of a famine in Moab. And when they arrived there, the women of that city, of that town said, can this be Naomi? Ruth 120 says, recounts this story, and Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Folks, when, when testings become really extended and painful, we get to the degree of not just seeing a situation that's bitter, we get to the degree of identifying with the bitterness. Call me Mara. 
And it's hard. I'm not here to decide how we should feel or what you should feel. But I'm saying people speak out from their heart. She was speaking. But what was redemptive in this, in this story was that she actually recognized the Lord in the situation. That the Almighty, because they actually went back to their homeland. And she re still recognized that God was in control of her life, even though on this side, she was in the affliction area. We know how the story ends. We know how her bitter story turns to sweet when she would eventually become the great-great-grandmother of the greatest kings in the line of Israel's royalties. Exodus chapter 15, verse 25. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. The Lord tells us not just to reveal our hearts to us, but also to teach us his statutes. Why does he want to teach us his statutes, his rules, his principles? Because he wants us to know him. He wants us to understand how to relate with him. He wants us to see how he conducts his affairs. Verse 26, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, if you will diligently listen, and if you will do that which is right in his eyes. And if you will give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, he had a promise. He was making a promise here. He is a promise-keeping God. We've been singing about that. But the promise had a prerequisite. If you hold on to this, if you do this, if you get my words and just abide by them, I promise you the diseases that you've seen in Egypt, they will not touch you. They will not be on you. Israel has been spared. They have a vivid memory of those diseases, the plagues. They, nobody wants that on them. But they were being taught that faithfulness to heed God's commands was for their well-being, was the manner by which they can remain in the protection and in the health of God. It shows that God's heart is for us to live in health and healing. Beloved, I need to say this. God's will is for us to live in health and healing. If there's somebody, you know, maybe you encountered this theology, no, this sickness is a blessing to me. That is not from the Bible. Later on, you will see how God would reveal himself as one of his covenant names. But I want to tell you that he's revealing himself right here when they are not yet sick. You don't need to get into a sickness to know God as your health giver and healer. But when you think that way, that, oh, this sickness is a blessing to me. No. For as long as there is life, we fight for that life. We keep believing, we keep praying, we do what we can, and we trust the Lord for what he will do. Because whether we get our healing on this side of life or in the next, God will heal us. <laughs> Hallelujah. How do you know that, Pastor Sky? Well, we've read the book of Revelation. We read several New Testament passages that one day he's going to give us glorious bodies. After we die... <laughs> How many of you have thought about your glorious bodies? Eight-pack abs, you know, <laughs> flowing hair. Keep the hair, Lord. Thank you. Um, one of her friends, uh, Gene and Devin Mack, you know, they, they asked, approached us. Um, they brought Devin's father a couple of months ago. Um, he, had, he had carried something heavy beside a truck, and, and something snapped in his back, and, and he was on a bed for, for about two months. And so he had this back pain, and Devin was praying, Lord, if I could only bring him to church. And, and one day he came to church a couple months ago, and, and they asked for prayer, and then we prayed, and several people prayed, and we were believing for his healing. And then just about two weeks ago, he comes back, approaches us, me and Pastor Reggie, and he was saying, thank you for praying. He was without those, you know, what do you call those things that assist you in walking, that walker. And he was healed. He was just, just thankful. He was giving praise to God, and I said, wow. And, and, and Devin was saying, uh, you know, he, he even had a good time with the children and the trampoline. I said, wow, I didn't pray for the trampoline part, but <laughs> I'll take that healing, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God a clap of praise. You see, 
People ask, why do you pray for healing? Why do you pray for breakthrough? How do you do that when, when nothing in this life is sure? Well, there is something that is sure. It's called the statutes. Those statutes are immovable. The word of God is unbreakable. If you can break the word of God, it's tantamount to breaking God himself, but God will never be broken. God will never be broken. We need to get that Bible into our souls, into our hearts, beloved. If you've not been reading your Bible, listen to me. The word of God saves us, and the word of God preserves us. You see, the word that saves us is also the word that heals us. Jesus thought that the word of God is like a seed. If you want to see the fruit of that seed, you want to see the righteousness of God, the peace of God, and the joy of God, get that Bible into your life. If you can spend an hour on TV, why not an hour listening to the Bible? If you can spend so many hours doing something, how, many, how much more getting that eternal word? It's hard to expect healing when there's not much of that seed and power in our hearts. You want to know why people don't find it, you know, easy to pray? Because there's not much faith. But where does faith come from? Faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the word of God. What are you listening to? Are you listening to the voice of God? The voices that we listen to today will make or break us. It is crucial times. It is crucial times. Don't soak yourself in bad news. There's plenty to go around. Just live life. Get the good news into your life. Why do I pray for people? Because the love of God compels me. Because I know that God is a healer. And if I do not obey, I go astray. That's how it is. The word of God gives us hope. That hope grows into faith. And that faith has action. There's action that comes by believing that God can do something. There comes a time in our lives, in our situations, when all we have is a word from God. Can you really live on God's word? As students, we put our faith in Christ, and suddenly we were persecuted by our own families. And our parents would say, you know, you don't love me anymore. You know, by the way, I love my parents, just in case you're watching. This is an old story. I've forgiven them. I love you. Like, there was a time they told us, you don't love me anymore. You don't, you don't believe in what I, use, what I go to. You don't have my religion anymore. I said, but God knows I love you. But I have this thing. I couldn't explain. I have the word, you know. <laughs> what word? Some of my friends, they, they would be asked, can that Bible put food on the table? Can that Bible give you a job? Can that Bible give you a life? The answer is yes. Yes. We were talking to the youth last night. This Bible made me survive university. This Bible taught me to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. This Bible taught me to fellowship with the people who are filled with the Spirit. This Bible made me graduate university, helped me land a job, being hired by the very institute that dismissed me. This Bible... That wonders in my life, it can do wonders in yours. This Bible, and one of my friends from campus ministry here is Mark and Gail. And you know, we grew up in the same campus ministry. This Bible helped us find the right spouses. And this Bible is still helping us raise our kids today. <laughs> Hallelujah. You want your children to have a life, give them the Bible. Give them the word of God. The past five years has been... God has been telling me, leave your country, your people in the Father's household. Lord, is there any other word for me? For like three years. Really, Lord? There's only one word? <laughs> Go and make disciples of all nations. Lord, and I started attending, and I just attended just for fun. I said, what, what would God tell me in this church? <laughs> Go and make disciples. Started tuning into a different podcast, not an every nation one. God is saying, get out of that nation. Go to where I'm going to. Where am I going to go? I don't know. Where I'm gonna go? He said, just, just decide to go and then you'll know. Then you'll know. More than five years after, here we are. Here we are. The Lord tests us to reveal our hearts to us, to teach us his statutes, and finally to reveal himself. I will put none of the diseases on you that I put in the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer, Jehovah Rapha. 
He truly desires a personal relationship with us. In this case, he uses his covenant name, one of the seven covenant names. And what does that mean? He binds himself, he binds himself to an attribute. He says, if you do this, you will know me as this. If you, if you hold to my word, you will know me as healer. And there are several more that you will see in this series. You see, when God revealed himself as, as provider, he told a man named Abraham, he said, give me your son, sacrifice him on the mountain. Abraham did not say, are you talking about this son that I've been praying for, the, the one son that like you said I'm gonna have an heir? He didn't question, he just obeyed. He just went up this mountain, left his servant, brought his son, brought the fire. The son says, I got the fire. Where's the sacrifice? You provide fire. I provide sacrifice. God stops him. Hey, okay, when he was about to kill his son, now I know you won't deny me anything. That was a test. He says, I am the Lord who provides. On this mountain, on this mountain, you will remember me. I am the Lord who provides. That same mountain, they made a sacrifice during David's time. That same mountain, the son of God was sacrificed. The word is directly correlated to the very attributes of God, the nature of God. He wants us to hear his voice and to receive his healing. He wants us to remember that he is a healer. It's God's will to heal us. The Lord tests us to show what is in our hearts, to teach his statutes, and to reveal himself to us. The people grumbled after they saw the miracles, after they saw the parting of the Red Sea, after they saw fire down from heaven and a cloud protect them. How can you forget? You see, the miracles are great. I would pray for miracles. I love to see miracles from God. But the miracles were not to be their foundation. The miracles were supposed to be evidences of what God was teaching them. Beloved, let us not be just pursuing miracles. We pursue the miracle worker. The miracle is not the foundation. There's only one foundation, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. There is no, one, no foundation that can be laid other than the one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If we base our life, if we let ourselves be founded on the person and work of Christ, his passion, his resurrection, his ascension, and the Holy Spirit's coming, let me tell you, this life is going to be strong. No matter what tests come our way, we will outlast it. I just wanted to highlight verse 25 again. For though the people grumbled, a man cried out to the Lord. The Lord showed him a log. I was asking the Lord, what's with the log? Other versions showed him a tree, showed him a piece of wood. And somehow Moses knew to, what to do with it, threw it into the water. But the Lord showed that to Moses. You see, the log and the tree was not intended here by the writer to, the, to display some chemical effect. You know, making salty, not salty that it was only a sign and not a means for the cure. I mean, how does a log make you know, bitter water sweet? Some commentaries say that the log or the tree symbolized the purifying power of the cross. Another commentator said, it's typical of the cross of Christ, which sweetens the bitter waters of affliction to all the faithful and enables them to rejoice in tribulation. I believe that verse 25 display, displays the power of one man who would trust God and cry out to him, resulting in the salvation of many. I believe it was a foreshadow of how one man suffering with the rest of the multitude, when that one man cries out and depends on the one being who could save, I believe it was a foreshadow of God incarnate who at one point in his life, while dying on the cross, said, I thirst. Exhausted by the heat, by the persecution, by the, the, the whipping and the crown of thorns, exhausted by carrying a log, 
Jesus at, one, at two points in his life cried out to God. In his most painful moment, Matthew 27, verse 46, it says, at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 27, verse, chapter 27, verse 50 of Matthew, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. One man cried out to God and saved a multitude. You and I are saved because one man trusted God. That one man is why we're here today. And if you have never given your life to Christ, we're going to ask you to open your heart today. Because that one man who died rose again to open the, spree, the streams of living water, the waters of eternal life that we might drink and never thirst again. Every test has an end. Jesus Christ's test ended. There's gonna be a pass your papers moment always. In the end of Jesus' life, there was a testimony. What is at the end of your test? Will there be a testimony? Cry out to God. Father, would you come and rescue us from ourselves? Thank you for your concern that you would take the time to reveal our hearts to ourselves. Thank you, God, for every man and woman in this room is loved by you, cared for by you. If you're here, beloved, and you are going through a test. We want to pray for you. Whether it's been long or short, whether it's hard or very painful and very painful, we want to pray for you. You're not alone. The Lord is with you. And as a family, we can pray together. We believe that you're here so that you can be joined by the rest of the saints in faith. If that's you, would you please lift up your hand? No shame. No fear. Just lift it up high and just think about your situation. Think about these tests. And you're probably trying to ask God, Lord, where does it end? God is assuring you there's an end to this test. My Lord, I pray for faith. Let your grace be poured out among our brothers and our sisters, lifting up their hands. Lord, you know where they're at. You're with them in that place. Lord, you feel their pain. You know their thoughts and how it has robbed them of sleep. Some of them, even their health. Lord, we pray, would you come and show, not just their hearts, but show yourself in the midst of. Reveal your name to them now. You who is the great I am. Lord, you can be all that we need you to be. Lord, right now, be all that for each and every single one of my brothers and my sisters. Rescue them. Show them. Speak to them. Let them feel your presence, God. Increase their ability to trust you. Lord, this faith is even a gift from you. Would you pour out such a grace? Would you give them the right words? Allow them to have a greater certainty of your nearness. Put your hands down. Bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're here, you've never given your life to Christ. There's an invitation for you. Lord is saying, son and daughter, come. I want to cleanse your heart from the things that are creating dangers in your soul. And you're in a place of desperation because of bad decisions, because of sins. The Lord is saying, come to me. Let me change your heart. If you're that person, and you're, maybe you've been reading the Bible, maybe not. Maybe you've been going to church, maybe not. But you're here, you're saying, I need, I need Jesus to change my life, change my heart. Beloved, there's a miracle today. It's called the miracle of a changed heart. Would you receive it? With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, would you lift up your hand and say, that's me, would you pray for me? I would like to pray for you. If that's you, I see those hands. Anyone else? Yes, yes. So many hands all across this room. God is, is cleansing you right now. Would you, over the breath of your lips, say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Teach me to trust in you. I believe that you are Lord. 
the Son of God who died on the cross and rose again so that I might have a new heart and a new life. Father, in the name of Jesus, even as you've heard prayers and hands lifted up, Lord, I pray, would you do that miracle right now? I thank you, God, for all heaven is rejoicing over every child that's lifting up their hands at this very moment. Would you come and change their lives? Hallelujah. Let's all give God a clap of praise. Thank you so much for watching. If you have questions or prayer requests, please email us at info at kingspark.org or message us on one of our social media channels. If you would like to give, you can do so by visiting kingspark.org giving or by downloading the Kings Park app.